in this picture, which one is the professional soccer player? Any idea? So one said the one on the left. What do you think? The one on the right? One with the ball. Okay, so if I were to say someone was a professional soccer player, what would you need to prove that? Skills, right? Just them telling you they had skills or probably want to see the skills they had. Well, one of these two men up here on the screen faked that he was a professional soccer player. You see, one of the things soccer players do is they make a website highlighting themselves. For instance, this is Cristiano Ronaldo's website, and one of the first things you can see up here is career highlights. So one of these two men up here made a fake website highlighting his career and how well he played. The other thing they do is they put together a resume or a CV of the different places they played, like this one. This gentleman also put together a fake resume of the locations and the places that he played in. Well, this man was so convincing that PSG, or if I'm saying it wrong, some of you soccer people in here can correct me, Paris Saint Germain, he convinced them to pay him 15,000 euros and signed him to a contract. This man was George Axelrod. The question goes, if I put on a jersey, does that make me a professional athlete? Does it? No. There's something else that has to visibly come with that. <laughs> yeah, money. Yeah. How about for those who claim to follow Christ? Is there a guarantee that should come with a Christian? Just because you say you're a Christian doesn't mean if I put on a, a soccer jersey that I'm a professional soccer player. And maybe I'm good at convincing people that I do the right things or I, I walk the, the walk. But should there be a guarantee that comes when you say, I am a Christian? Now, maybe you're in here this morning and, and you don't even claim that, and that's okay. You're still going to find some insight into what this is, or maybe that will help you gain some clarity on some things. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 21. And this living parable, as we're going to see, actually begins with Jesus' triumphal entry. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 21, verse 7. You can either turn in your Bible or your tablet, or it will be up here on the screen for us as well, behind. Maybe you know a story. Jesus tells some disciples to go get a donkey. For him to ride into Jerusalem. And it says, They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them over the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? And the crowds replied, "Is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. That's what today is celebrated as Palm Sunday as we look to Easter. But we're going to go beyond that to the first two things Jesus does. You ride into the city, you got one week left in his earthly ministry, what do you do? Well, many believers or followers of Jesus at the time believed that Jesus was going to overthrow the government and establish an earthly kingdom to make things right. And that's often what we can do with Jesus. We want Jesus to come in and make everything right here on this earth. But as we talked about last week, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. That the kingdom of God is a future reality where, yes, one, one day everything will be restored. But more importantly, it's the Christian life is not about Jesus changing everything around you. It's about changing you, yourself. It's about the transformation of your life. And so in this moment, Jesus doesn't challenge the king's throne. 
he actually goes and confronts the temple. The place where it would be the most holiest, the place where people would meet. He doesn't go and fix everybody's situation. He goes and confronts the temple. Or we could say in our context, if Jesus rode into town, he'd be going to the churches, not everywhere else, to fix first. It says this, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. Now you might say, well, isn't that good? They're helping people buy animals for sacrifices? Well, you understand how it works, right? It's how prices can get jacked up and someone's got a monopoly over here and it was for dishonest gain. It wasn't for the purpose of really sacrificing to God. He says, he said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. Then it says, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law saw these wonderful miracles and he, he heard even the children in the temple shouting, praise God for the son of David. But the leaders were indignant. They asked Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus replied. Haven't you ever read the scriptures? For they say you have taught children and infants to give you praise. Then Jesus returned to Bethany where he stayed overnight. So Jesus rides into town, triumphal entry, last week here on earth, and he goes to the temple to get that place right. The next thing he does is in the morning, as Jesus was returning to Jerusalem, he was hungry, and he noticed a fig tree beside the road. He went over to see if there were any figs, but there were only leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again, and immediately the fig tree withered up. He says, may you never bear fruit again. The disciples were amazed when they saw this and asked, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? Then Jesus told them, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and don't doubt, you can do things like this and much more. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. You can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you'll receive it. The number two things that Jesus does when he rides into town, cleans up the temple, and has a fig tree wither up. Now typically on Palm Sunday, we hear maybe hear a sermon about Jesus' entry and, the, and the, the palm branches laid down for him. But we're going to be talking about him cleaning up the temple and withering a fig tree. The two first things he does when he comes into town. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, Jesus withering a fig tree, does that fit with his character? Right? Do we see Jesus in his ministry? When I envision this, I envision someone like, you know, that has like these... these superpowers, right? And they don't like the way something goes, and so he like points his finger because he was hungry, right? Anybody ever been hangry in here and done something you regretted afterwards? Right? This was said. Jesus was hungry. That's not what Jesus is getting at here, though. Jesus could have found food probably anywhere. He could have, he remember, remember a little bit ago, he took a couple of loaves of fishes and bread and multiplied them for 5,000 plus people. It wasn't the issue, it wasn't that he was hungry. The issue is that he was com connecting, he's giving a visual picture to what he just did in the temple. He ultimately was giving what we call a living parable, using something real to give a spiritual reality to it. Again, a parable is something we throw alongside to give a spiritual reality. And ultimately, today, tying this all together, in the king and his kingdom... The kingdom of God is the call to bear fruit in our lives. This fig tree didn't have any. So you might say, what's up with the fig tree? Anybody, anybody in here a fig expert? Right? Maybe the only fig experts we have in here are those who eat fig newtons. I remember my grandfather had his little stash of fig newtons, and I'd steal a couple. I'm not even sure what I was thinking tasted awful. But if you know anything, if you come up to a fig tree and it has leaves on it, the first thing a fig tree does is it has these little buds of these little tiny figs, and then the leaves will come, and then larger figs will come. So you could, if there was leaves, there should be at least something there to pluck off and eat. But there wasn't anything. 
And so again, Jesus takes this and gives a spiritual reality to this. Now again, it's in connection to the temple. In your mind, you could think about the church. Let's look at it this way. In Jesus' beginning of his ministry, he did the same, something similar. In John chapter 2, it says, it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at the tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, turned over the tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. This was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In the, be- in the middle of Jesus' ministry, there is a, a pa- another actual real parable told in Luke chapter 13, and Jesus says this, a man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit, but it was always disappointed. Finally, he said to the gardener, I've waited three years, and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking space up in the garden. And so in this context, triumphal entry, Jesus cleanses the temple. Well, Jesus did it in the beginning of his ministry. He did it at the end of his ministry. He gave it three years to bear fruit and found no fruit in the temple. He said, get this place right. This, my father's house is a house of prayer. It's a house of healing. It's a house of restoration. It's a place for people to come and meet God. But you've turned it into something else. And in three years' time, like the fig tree that was taking up space, he goes and cleanses it again because it wasn't bearing the fruit that it was called to bear. And again, the kingdom of God is a call to bear fruit. So let's look at this idea of bearing fruit a little bit deeper. It says here again in in Matthew 21, verse 18, it says, In the morning as Jesus was returning to Jerusalem, he was hungry. He noticed a fig tree beside the road. He went over to see if there were any figs, but there were only leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree withered up. I just gave you the context of if there was leaves on the tree... There should have been at least what to go with it. Something of a fruit. Now, it might have been early in the season, but there at least should have been at least a little bit to, to pull off and munch on. The first call of this idea to bear fruit is the idea of promise without fulfillment. It shows that there's the promise of fruit, but there is no fruit. I, I, I go back to the question, what is the guarantee that should come with a Christian? If you claim to follow Christ, what is the guarantee that should come with you? What is the warranty, right? What is the warranty that should come with you? Well, would you hold on? We'll get to that. As Jesus looks at the temple, this is what the temple structure would look like. As someone would walk by the temple, what do you think they would think about that place? What should it be good for? Should it be good for, I'm going to get extorted there. I'm going to get myself raked over the coals. The other thing that they would do is, in, the other, in another text of Scripture, they would say that people would actually enter a gate here and, and enter one over there. It was actually a shortcut through the city. And people were making people pay to take the shortcut. That's not what the temple was designed for. The temple was designed for people to meet with him. He says this, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. All right. What do people think when they drive by on 920 Turn Street? What is it that they think? Is there a promise that should come because you're a church? Maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you've had a, a, a long path getting to this point because of that. There's a, a, Barna, there's a Barna study that was made into a uh, document and it says, openness to Jesus isn't the problem. The church is. Basically what that's saying is the church in and of itself isn't the issue. 
it's Jesus' bride is, that, is the issue. If you can boil it down, they said the number one thing that people had an issue was hypocrisy. Now, here's the deal. If you are a follower of Christ, realistically, you're probably one of the biggest hypocrites that exist. Because you declare to live by one way, but because we are all sinners and fall short of God's glory, we're probably always going to have things to work on that don't line up. It's, be, it's, it's when we, it's when we choose to live a different way than the way we should be living and say there's nothing wrong with that. Or it's when I just go and I live so differently that my life Monday through Sunday doesn't reflect what my life looks like on Sunday. It's not having faith permeate every part of our lives. It's compartmentalizing it to one area. I have a pastor friend who says there's two, diff- there's two types of people. You're either a hypocrite or you're a forgiven hypocrite. That's it. Right? We, we all have that in our life, but typically, if we confess to live one way, there should be a guarantee that goes with it. There should be a promise that comes with you saying, I'm a follower of Christ. Are you living up to that promise if you claim to follow Jesus this morning? Maybe you're here again trying to figure it out. And I get it. If you've been hurt, if someone in the church has done something to you, I get that it's real. I get that you've probably driven by church after church thinking it's good for nothing. I get it. And sometimes, Christians, we, we, we get to conf- own up to that. We have to own up to say, yes, yeah, sometimes we do fall short. Sometimes we get focused on the wrong things. Sometimes we're not here for the right reasons. Or we simply haven't just worked through our stuff ourselves, which we'll get to in a minute. But Jesus says, here's a, here's a great promise. The blind and lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. That's what the place should be for. The place should be for hope. Or next Sunday, for, at Easter, we're going to see an awesome testimony in a baptism that's what the church is about. Life transformation. People's lives being transformed. Hearts being renewed. The next thing we see with this is the idea of the appearance of faith. It looks really good. Looks really good. There's a story told uh, of a man who was building homes out in Montana. And as this man was building these homes, he went away for a couple weeks. Now, let me pause there. Anybody, anybody want this type of lifestyle? Right? I, I prefer neighbors, but uh, some of you might enjoy this. It looks great. Property's awesome. Lights are on. Some of you can smell the coffee that's brewing on the counter. But there was a windstorm that kicked up, and the door got ajarred and opened. And when this builder came back three weeks later, he peered around the corner to that. These cows moved in and made their home. You see, it looked really good, but on the inside, it was gross and messy. The appearance of faith, maybe you look the part of faith. You know, to do, you know how to do all the right things. You know how to check all the boxes. But inside, it's not real. Or inside, it's a complete mess. And it's just a covering for a hollow, formal, false, counterfeit faith. Are you keeping up a good appearance, but are empty or a mess on the inside? I get it. Sometimes we can say, yes, this is where I'm at. But that's the whole thing. Jesus came to clean up the temple, not keep it a mess. It's okay to come to Jesus with your mess. It's not okay to stay in your mess. Jesus wants to clean your mess up. He doesn't want you to fake that you're doing okay. Go find someone and tell them that you're not. You know the hypocrisy thing? Hypocrisy is typically what we oftentimes can't can, can tell someone something's not going well. We fake like everything's okay, but it's not. Being real and authentic is sometimes a good place to be. 
The last one here we're going to see is profession without practice. That you profess to be a believer. Let me go back to, if I put on that pro jersey, what is it that you want to see from me in the parking lot? Right? You want to see if I can handle the ball a little bit. Maybe kick one so hard through your windshield. There's something that has to go with it. And with this fig tree pitcher, he's asking the question, if you claim to be a believer, what are you producing in your life? What is it that you're producing? Look at your life. Think about that. This can go across the board whether you claim to follow Jesus or not. What is it that you are producing in your life? Let me take this one step further in the Christian life. We can go to the idea of producing, reproducing, and multiplication. For some of you, if you're new to faith in Jesus, there's a producing that goes along with our faith. Maybe you've been a believer long, and maybe you consider yourself a leader. You should be reproducing other people, which means getting somebody else to be bearing the same fruit you are. Whether that's through their lifestyle, or through how they do ministry in some capacity. And the last one would be multiplication. Right? A good idea of multiplication would be the idea of a dandelion. You blow on it, and next thing you know, you had one, and now there's a thousand in your yard. Taking it and going out. Bearing fruit isn't just what you produce, but it's how can you get that in somebody else's life as well. The call of being a disciple. As we looked at last, last series we were in, the question might come back to you, are you a consumer in the kingdom of God, or are you a builder? Here's a couple other just questions to help you sift through that. How is the life of Christ being formed or seen in you? How is the life of Christ being formed or seen in you or in me? What tangible difference am I making being a follower of Christ? Think about that. I know for a fact I don't want Jesus to look at me one day and be like, you weren't producing any fruit. You were just taking up space. You were just taking up space. So let's pull back a little bit and ask the question, what does fruit look like? It's a weird word to use, right? Some of you can't stand the word fruit. You've never had a piece of it. I know who you are. What does fruit look like? Now you can throw some things out. Give me something. What does fruit look like? Okay, so we can use those words, right? We can throw it out there, and we're great at the Christian life of the, of the, of the appearance of faith, and we can throw those things out there. What does love look like? Action, right? Compassion, right, in an active way. Okay, good. Death to yourself. Sure. Yeah. Service. Serving somebody else. Stop thinking about yourself so much. Yeah. What are some other ones? Forgiveness. You can go to this context in, in Mark's, Mark's uh, accounting of this story, and he says, yeah, one of the greatest ways you can bear fruit is by forgiving someone who's hurt you. It's one of the greatest ways. Yeah. Any other? What do you, give me another one. Okay. So they have to see something in us, right? They have to see something in us, right? You can't just put the jersey on. Right? Good. Any other ones that come to your mind? Compromise? Maybe. Depends what the situation is. <laughs> okay, but it has to be something that people can see. Yeah, Mike, Mike said the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. Right? If it's self-control, it has to be something that's seen. It has to be an actual. And you can't be like, oh, I got self-control, but then you have none of it. Right? It has to be something that actually takes place. We'll see that in a minute. 
Another great question to ask, what type of fruit is Rome Alliance producing? What are we producing? What are people around us saying about who we are and what, what God's doing in our lives? Well, let's give us one more step in this process as we turn the corner. Let's give ourselves a recipe for fruit in our life. We talked about how we can kind of like fake it till we make it. We talked about what fruit is, and now we're going to talk about how do we make it. He says here in Matthew 21, he says, The disciples were amazed when they saw this and asked, How the fig tree withers so quickly. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and don't doubt, you can do things like this and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up, thrown into the sea, and it will happen. You can pray for anything. If you have faith, you'll receive it. In Mark's gospel, he, he shares this same story. I just want to add this other piece to it. He says, Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say this to the mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea. Now, again, is he giving another living parable in a sense? He's not really telling you that you can lift up a mountain and throw it into a sea. Right? I've never seen anybody do that. But he's giving you the visual image of what can happen. He says, but you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. So as we round the corner, let's talk about this recipe for fruit in our lives based on the story of the fig tree. The first thing is you have to have faith in Jesus. And the first thing... Jesus wants to do in your life is change you from the inside out. He wants to transform you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anybody's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, and the new is here. Believe it or not, I do some gardening. I know I don't look like it, but I've tried to learn about soil and how to, how to plant, and there's a lot of times if I put it in the wrong thing, or I, I've, I've taken something out too early, it, just withers and dies. The condition of what's going on on the inside of us is the beginning of fruit. It's not something I just make up. It's not something I just try really hard to do. It comes out of a transformed life. Bearing fruit comes out of transformation, which goes back to, he says, believe in God, faith in Jesus. It asks the question, what do I honestly believe about something? Deep in my heart, what do I believe? Faith in Jesus it's not just an intellectual thing. When he says the word believe, it was a lifestyle change that went with it. It's a surrendering of to go with it. Turning from my sin, believing in his finished work on the cross and resurrection, but it, it's a life that's changed. The second thing for a recipe is prayer, but he says pray in such a way that you expect God to actually do something about it. It's a good way to do it. It goes back to the appearance of faith, right? I pray just because I feel like I check the box to pray. Or I just have to, have to have it. But also, he, he says something along the lines of, you know, you can ask for anything and it will happen. Now, he doesn't, that, again, you can't take that actual either. Just like I said, you can't pick up a mountain and throw it. He's not saying, well, you know what? I really want that BMW, God, and I'm going to pray for that. Now, sometimes maybe God does bless that way. But that's not what the point of this is. He's saying, if you have faith in Jesus, if he cleanses your temple, it's going to change what you're praying for. It's going to change how you view life. It's going to change what you're looking at and how, what you want to see God do and take place. And then when God changes how you pray, he says, pray in such a way that you expect even the biggest mountain, Mount Everest, to be tossed up and chucked into the sea. Maybe we lack fruit because we really deep down don't expect God to do anything. We deep down don't think God can show up and do something. In fact, when we go back to it, we just live in our box that we've created God to be in. And we've put him in this box, and this is the life called to live. Lastly, the recipe for fruit, for fruit is that there's an action. Something, or move, something moves or has to be seen. When he says that the mountain gets thrown up, there's an action. It's not just passive. You don't just pray and sit and have nothing happen. Life, actually, the life of bearing fruit is a balance between, I have my faith in Jesus, and it's a balance between prayer and action. When people see something, they should, sorry, when people see fruit in our lives, it's something they actually can see 
hold on to. It's not an intellectual thought. It's not aspirational. It's not an ideal I have in my head. Like, I have the idea to love people. Sure, and so sometimes we settle there. I had the idea to do it. But what's it actually look like lived out? People actually have to see it. Fruit is tangible. Imagine if someone comes up to you and says, try this apple, and you're like, nothing is in your hand. Or, again, I've planted vegetables that literally the plant does do nothing. And you're like, all right, we're going to throw this out. It has to be seen. So this week, I want you to do three things. Number one, I want you to take an inventory of your fruit in your life. Again, this isn't, this isn't for self like promoting or anything. Just say, Lord, show me the things. Where am I, where am I producing fruit in your life? Now I get it. With, with God, it's, it's not always, like you might be in the beginning process of it. Or you might be doing something, hoping it bears fruit down the road. That's okay, right? Again, think about it, a plant. Right? If I, if I buy a plant from the store this spring, it might say it takes 80 days to produce fruit. So again, keep it in the context of something that do. Right? Anybody, apple people? Usually it takes what, a couple years for your trees to produce fruit. Keep that in your context of your inventory you're taking. Take an inventory of, the, of where you're, uh, what, what fruit you're producing in your life. If you're not a follower of Christ, you could even take a step back and say, what am I doing? Where am I spending my time? Is it productive? Is it doing something to benefit other people, love other people, serve other people? Secondly, where are you at in this process? Are you producing? Maybe you consider yourself a leader. Ask yourself, are you reproducing yourself? Are you multiplying? And lastly, this week is simply the call to ask God to show you some areas of your life where you can go and bear fruit. Where you can go and bear fruit.